the ivory tusk is not an object. It is not an artifact. It is not art. Although it merges the inhuman and cruel legacy of this colonial world, this ivory tusk belongs to the royals. To the royals you don't know, but you should. The purpose of the carved ivory tusk in Benin tradition is to commemorate um, a dead oba. The um, objects from the oba's palace, which were taken during the Benin expedition of 1897, are often in Western sort of museums considered art objects. Um, but we know, especially with the tusk, um, that it was part of the altarpiece. Um, it was part of an important place of sort of worship um, for people, um, but it was also incredibly personal. Um, so it's commissioned, you know, for the Oba who dies, and it's a way of people, um, I know, people understanding and knowing what came before them and, and a way to sort of connect with ancestry. So, you know, the, the depictions on the tusk um, are of uh, Europeans, are of Edo people, they're of crocodiles and mudfish and all sorts of different sort of animals and, and plants and people. To think of them as art, um, although they are incredibly skilled people who are crafting these objects, um, is, is missing a lot of the deeper um, sort of meaning, not only from a kind of spiritual connection um, with ancestry and with the past, um, but also, of course, the, the kind of meaning behind um, the images and the, the way that it's carved um, becomes a very personal um, thing for families. Um, ivory, specifically elephant ivory, is very important. Um, starting with the animal, um, elephants are really a symbol of authority, of kingship, of ruling, um, so they become very connected with the Oba in that sense that, you know, elephants are revered um, animals. Um, and obviously, you know, the, the sort of killing of an elephant is a very um, difficult thing, um, but it was also something that wasn't done, um, it wasn't done very often, um, and it was done with exceptional skill. Um, so using sort of bow and arrow and poisons and, you know, obviously not using things like machine guns. So the bronze or brass head that the, the tusk would have rested on would have also been sort of cast and made specifically for that oba. So it is important that it is connected to the tusk. So one of the things that would have been done during um, the looting of, um, of the oba's palace in 1897 was these would have been separated because at the time the ivory was seen as something that was important to fund the, the expeditions. The museum display um, just sort of continues this separation by having all of the objects completely separated um, as art pieces, really, as, as you would think, you know, in a, in a sort of modern glass museum display, rather than being objects that were grouped together for significant reasons um, as it would have been originally. So I think that's the, that's the real challenge of a museum like the Pitt Rivers is for us to actually sort of get these, these um, objects back into their context, to tell these stories and to bring in more voices um, that can interpret you know, these objects for, for our visitors. I think um, it is not proper for um, items in museums in Europe to, to be discussed without considering the people that created them and used them and still use them and understand what the items really stand for. So when you don't include the owners in discussions, you tend to have a very... Um, out of their discussion and a biased discussion. So it is proper for um, museums all over the world to include um, the indigenous people who own items in those museums in decision makings, in research, and uh, other form of discussions concerning those items. 
we are currently in um, discussion with the National Museum and Monuments Commission of Nigeria, who have officially requested the return um, of 96 objects, including this ivory tusk. And the university has, the council has approved this. Um, they are for the return of, um, of these objects. And I think this is exactly what we should be doing. We should be absolutely having these conversations um, with different communities about the return of, of objects. And it's very well documented that the, um, that the Obis Palace was completely burned down and looted. So in, in this situation, I think we have very clear historic evidence that the objects were stolen. Well, one of the important um, reasons why these items uh, should be returned back to where they were taken from, because one, they are items that contain the history of the Edo people, right? And the current generation of um, Edo people are disconnected from their past. Our history was disrupted by the coming of the British and the colonial system, because the colonial system, uh, the policy of the colonial system was to um, erase what they met and replace it with the English and the European uh, uh, ideologies, uh, philosophies, and practices. So right now, there's a gap between this generation and the generation that used those items. And right now, um, we are all yearning to connect back to our ancestors, connect back to our base, so we know who we are. And so one of the really important tasks of re the research team in the museum, um, which I work as part of, is to do this work, um, to understand where our collections are coming from, um, what communities might want to engage with them, re-engage with them. Um, at the moment, it's really, I think, a process of museums going through repair, um, of, of really sort of documenting the provenance of, of objects that are in the collection, and then essentially building these relationships with originating communities. Um, because every... Um, Every uh, sort of um, case of, of return or repatriation, whatever you want to call it, is different. The last time an item was, re uh, was returned to the palace, it was received with great ceremony. It was, it was like the Oba was very happy, the chiefs were very happy, the people of the kingdom were happy. The, new, the media carried the news, it was on the news, on all stations. Because I'd like to show you how we are being, these items are being received. People are trying to, to connect back to their ancestors. They are trying to know themselves from those items and see who they are. That once upon a time, our ancestors did this, our ancestors did that, and we can learn from this. We can be better people tomorrow. Um, there's something quite depressing about how the majority of the artifacts in this museum that are given the space for audiences and both curators are male-coded artifacts. And even the artifacts that we've studied in this project are exclusively from patriarchal, male-led societies. And I think it's quite curious that um, both curators and audiences have not given the space for the stories to be told of pre-colonial women in these societies. And that even there just is a lack of presence of stolen artifacts in a museum pertaining to women. Worship, worshiper, worship her ivory brood, strength and power in her dedication, a document of a nation her heart belongs to. Iyo, Iyoba, Iye, Yeshe. Ghastly sons of man, the sin of Cain in your hearts. Queen mother is and first forevermore. Mm. Adoration and praise. Hail thee, queen mother of Benin. I carve my love for you, for all to see, and bear witness to what is an account of your glory. My love for you, 
and adoration for everything you do. Worship, worship her, worship her. Hail thee, Queen Mother of Benin, I carved my love for you. I imagine times before crucial disasters. As long as strangers are in charge of me, nothing will change. And without change, there is no future. I feel obscure. Obscure like these rooms that I'm kept in. How am I supposed to bloom to blossom? Blossoming while people try to strip my identity away.